Do you feel that it was important that there was a national media debate in New Zealand about cluster bombs in the run-up to and uh, during the conference? So, in the run-up to the conference in Wellington, members of the Aotearoa New Zealand uh, Cluster Munition Coalition uh, started to organise a whole series of different events, um, mainly to educate the public, but another main element of that was to create awareness uh, much more broadly, including uh, media interest. And uh, I think we, we achieved that objective. Both the domestic press coverage was great and internationally we got some very good uh, wire stories and, and other coverage. Um, and that was basically to keep the pressure on the governments to realise that the world is watching them and what they're doing and, and New Zealanders are supportive of what they were trying to do. Um, but if they kind of backtrack or seek to weaken it, then they're going to get some negative media. Uh, and for the countries who did get the negative media during the Wellington Conference, some of them were very upset about that, but it was a good indicator of what will come uh, when they actually come to negotiate if they continue that kind of behaviour. And there was a stunt that took place in Civic Square. Can you um, describe what happened there and the effect that had on the delegates at the so it was a five-day conference, and on the middle day, the Wednesday, the 20th of February, um, the Aotearoa New Zealand Class Munition Coalition had worked with Draft FCB to put together a, a, a stunt, as you call it, um, which involved people lying down on the pavement and having a chalk silhouette drawn around their body. And then when they stood up, they could sign it, and that would constitute their petition uh, against cluster bombs. And we put the call out there through the national media, through adver advertisements, um, through posters which were all up across town uh, and, and throughout all of the NGO networks and got more than a thousand people to come down to Civic Square at midday to participate in the stunt. Um, so it was great for public engagement. A lot of youth came down as well and they'd been doing it in their schoolyards and stuff in the, in the week leading up to the conference and it enabled everybody to you know think about what it would be like to have your city bombed by cluster munitions you know to be in a cluster munition strike um, and but the other thing that it did was uh, it was an opportunity for the campaigners who were inside the conference and for many of the delegates the governments participating to get out of there get out in the sunshine and participate in this as well because things were not going so well inside the room, uh, the debate was also sharpened outside during that event with a series of placards and messages for the media to kind of let everyone know that uh, a small group of countries was trying to mess with the text. Uh, and that stunt was really helpful for us to get um, the coverage that we were hoped for. Since then, many campaigners have gone back home and taken that idea and some of the other ideas that they saw in Wellington back with them and they're, they're doing their own chalk silhouettes and you know adopting it and changing it and that's that's great I'm really happy about that. Um, what do you feel was the overall outcome of the Wellington Conference? The main result of the Wellington Conference in the diplomatic sense was that the governments um, were given the choice on the final day to endorse what they called the Wellington Declaration. Wellington Declaration is a very short document um, and it really serves two purposes. It reaffirms um, the Oslo Declaration agreed to a year before and that governments uh, commit themselves again to negotiate the treaty, to prohibit cluster munitions that pose unacceptable harm, to include the humanitarian you know, provisions in that um, treaty, to do it in Dublin, Ireland, in May 2008, to negotiate it there, and to negotiate it on the basis of the text the draft treaty text that was discussed in Wellington. Remember the small group of countries, the like-minded powerful group of countries were really upset during the week when their proposals didn't make it into the text. So everybody was very curious to see who would actually endorse the declaration on the final day. And that was the one day of the conference where I actually got to sit in the plenary and listen as government after government after government spoke up and said, we endorse the Wellington Declaration. Uh, it was especially great that all of the developing countries, um, many countries that haven't gone on and, and banned, banned landmines and other weapons endorsed that declaration and signaled their support. Most of the Pacific did that. Uh, but even more significantly, the UK signed up, France signed up, Germany signed up, Canada, Japan. 
Uh, and there they realized that if they didn't do that, it would probably be even worse in terms of consequences for them to go home and face the media and face their um, NGOs and face their constituents if they backed out of the process to, to get rid of cluster bombs. So that was the kind of diplomatic outcome of the conference, the Wellington Declaration. There were many other kind of outcomes of the conference. Um, before the conference started, the Wellington public, the New Zealand public and media knew something about cluster munitions, but by the end of it, after seeing articles about it in the paper every day, uh, and after hearing about the debate and everything else, the level of awareness just has jumped up. Um, and other kind of uh, initiatives were launched off the back of the Wellington Conference, or given strength off the fact that this meeting took place uh, less than six weeks later, on the 4th of April, uh, the New Zealand Superannuation Fund announced that it would divest from companies that are engaged in the production of cluster munitions, and they took a lot of heat over the course of the conference because the, the shareholders, who are the New Zealand taxpayers, you know, woke up and realized that their pension funds were investing in companies such as Lockheed Martin, who uh, directly support the production of cluster munitions, and they, they were like, that's not on. So a lot of letters were written, and a lot of um, editorials, a lot of media coverage, and the super fund, I think, realized, uh-oh, we've got to do something about this. Uh, so they made the announcement that they will divest. I guess the only major issue that we've got with it is that they won't do that until the treaty is open for signature, which is going to be months away at the end of the year, and it's a step that they could take right now. Um, it follows hot on the heels of other divestment decisions they've taken to get away from uh, companies that are involved in tobacco or whaling, um, but it, it, it's not kind of comprehensive in that the super fund is still investing in companies that produce nuclear weapons, um, that abuse human rights, so there is a broader kind of set of issues there, but people, I think, realize that the divestment uh, and, and where their pension money goes is really important in the class diminution. Uh, campaign gave that a little bit of a boost. Um, we really built the domestic uh, coalition of NGOs. There's now 20 non-governmental organizations campaigning in New Zealand against cluster bombs. Um, we're publishing a faith letter in uh, the newspapers uh, in a few days' time, and that has received an overwhelming response from, I think, more than 85 uh, faith leaders from archbishops to all sorts of different faiths. Uh, all of who, you know, are completely behind the, the ban on cluster bombs now. That's great. And um, where to from here? What are your hopes now for the Dublin conference? So uh, the Wellington conference wrapped up on the 22nd of February and the governments went home. Now they're going to reconvene in Dublin, Ireland on the 19th of May for two weeks and that will be the negotiations of the treaty. Uh, we don't know how it's going to go down there. It, It'll be quite tense, I think, um, but hopefully we'll get a good outcome if the treaty is adopted on the final day of the conference and if it is a good, strong, effective treaty. Uh, New Zealand will be there. I'll be there along with a few others from the New Zealand Civil Society uh, and we'll all be working for the same goal. Uh, and if successful, if it's adopted at the end of May, then it will be open for signature later in the year, in December, most likely in Oslo, Norway, where the process started. Uh, and we'll want as many governments as possible to come out and sign the agreement then. Of course, New Zealand, but the Pacific, everybody needs to sign it. Uh, and then everybody needs to go home and ratify, make it legally binding domestically, and then get onto the really hard work, which is the implementation of the treaty. That's crucial. There's some governments that are not participating in this process that are obviously quite powerful and that um, are responsible for the problem, most notably um, Israel, the United States and Russia, but there's others who are not participating, China uh, among them. And that's disappointing, but uh, it's not an excuse for not acting. And that's basically what we saw over the last decade was a lot of inaction in diplomatic, traditional diplomatic fora to tackle cluster munitions and at the same time, you know, incidents of, of use from Kosovo and Serbia to Afghanistan to Iraq to Lebanon where civil society and the deminers and the people on the ground were like, just do something about this. So uh, it'll be really interesting to see who 
does turn out to sign it at the end of the year, but ultimately it will be the most significant advance in disarmament uh, lawmaking since the Landmine Treaty was adopted in 1997.